Today we're looking at Mac Recorder from Farallon Computing. The Macintosh was a groundbreaking personal computer when it made its debut in 1984. But while it could play back sound through its internal speaker or attached headphones, it had no audio input. Thankfully, a third-party solution arrived the following year. The Berkeley Macintosh User Group, aka BMUG, was founded in September 1984 by Reese Jones, a UC Berkeley grad student. He remained president of BMUG while also becoming president of his other creation, Farallon Computing. Mac Recorder came to life as a project that first appeared in the fall 1985 BMUG newsletter. I'd like to thank Marcus Notofer for providing me the download link to early BMUG newsletters which I've provided for you in the text description below. BMUG sold a Mac Recorder 2 kit for 45 US dollars, which adjusted for inflation is about $113 today in 2021. The newsletter also mentions Macforth, the very first programming language that allowed one to write Macintosh code on the Mac without the need for a Lisa, released by Creative Solutions in June 1984. The software for the Mac Recorder 2 kit was provided as Macforth source code. There are actually two projects presented in this Fall 1985 newsletter, both creations of Michael Lamour, then a mathematics graduate student at UC Berkeley, who later became a mathematics professor. The first Mac Recorder article in the newsletter by Ty Shipman covers an earlier version of the device presenting a host of technical details, including the A to D converter, filtering circuitry, and parts list. This Revision 1 kit was intended for use with the Macintosh 128 and 512K machines, which use DB9 connector serial ports. The commercialized Farallon version of Mac Recorder that came out two years later, however, was offered only for the Macintosh Plus and newer machines, which use Mini DIN 8 serial ports. As described later in the newsletter, the newer Mac Recorder 2 project added important new functionality, such as a lower noise A to D converter with onboard hold circuit, a gain adjustment for the microphone, and faster sampling rates by changing the crystal. The Macforth software written for the Mac Recorder 2 kit was quite rudimentary compared to what came later, but it served its purpose well, offering play, record, stop, and pitch controls. You'll notice in this screenshot there's a compression menu. Somewhat confusingly, that feature didn't condense the file size, but instead merely condensed the on-screen waveform. The biggest caveat of the Mac Recorder was its recording time, which was limited by available RAM. In researching the Mac Recorder release timeline, I found that the BMUG Mac Recorder kit was first mentioned on page 167 of the March 1987 issue of Mac World. And the first mention of Mac Recorder as a commercial Farallon product is found on pages 263 and 267 in the December 1987 issue of Mac World. It's hard to know the exact progression of the product packaging, but based on the tape recorder artwork shown here, which doesn't appear in later software versions, I must assume this photo to be of the very first Farallon commercial release. This next photo shows what might be the second revision of the packaging, with what appears to be a 1989 copyright on back. And this third photo seems to show what is perhaps the newest and last version of the Mac recorder packaging, with a 1990 copyright date and the System 7 logo on front. System 7 wasn't released until May 1991. Interestingly, the Baltimore Sun reports that Mac Recorder was used for the Space Shuttle Atlantis STS-43 mission in August 1991. A $7,300 Macintosh portable was taken aboard Atlantis to play alarms for the crew. That's a pretty expensive alarm. Prior to launch, NASA used Mac Recorder to replace hard-to-hear beep sounds with musical selections. That was important because the normal beep sounds couldn't easily be heard over the rather loud ambient noise level inside the shuttle. 
STS-43 was also the mission which sent the first email from space using Apple Link, a precursor to the internet. And on that same mission, a crew member demonstrated zero-gravity floppy disk ejection. Farallon also came out with a separate voice digitizer project, model MM120, in June 1990. Compared to the standard Mac recorder kit, the new device offered a smaller case, only very basic software for recording and playback within HyperCard, a retail price of $149, which was $100 less than the regular Mac recorder sound system. And of course, it had the same Mac Plus and later computer requirement. Most of you may know the name Steve Caps from the original system software that shipped with the Macintosh 128 in 1984. Steve moved from Xerox to Apple in 1981 to work on the Lisa, then moved to the Macintosh team in 1983 to co-write the Finder with Bruce Horn. In 1986, Caps took a leave of absence and traveled to Paris, where he wrote a brilliant audio editing application named SoundEdit which was eventually bundled with Farallon's Mac recorder in 1988. Let's now take a look at how to use the Mac recorder. It's a fairly simple device with the built-in microphone here. The slider on the side lets you adjust the gain of that built-in mic. And there's a 3.5 millimeter or 1 8 inch jack for adding an external microphone, and another jack for feeding line level audio into Mac Recorder from an external source. As you can see, there are no screws on this case. It's permanently sealed. That's unfortunately why I can't show you the circuit board inside. I simply don't want to slice open the case in order to do that. To use Mac Recorder, we need to start by connecting it to either of a compatible Vintage Max Mini Den 8 serial ports. I'll go ahead and connect it to the printer port of this SE30. And it doesn't matter if the Mac is powered on when you do this. And here is the software that we need to use Mac Recorder. Uh, we have various versions of Sound Edit. And you can download all of these apps from the Macintosh Garden, a link to which I've put for you in the text description below. Sound Edit 1.0, 1.1, and 2.2 all work under System 6, which is what I'm booted into now. Uh, you can even down, download edit the newest Sound Edit 16 from Macintosh Garden as well. Sound Edit will allow you to record and edit your sound, and it comes with a separate application called HyperSound, which is a HyperCard stack that will allow you to record and play back your sound. You cannot edit your sound in this particular HyperCard stack, but it does offer some nice features for using sounds within HyperCard stacks. We then have a tour of uh, Mac Recorder, which requires an older version of HyperCard. This is version 1.2.5, so I'll go ahead and open this. And we can see a basic introduction to Mac Recorder. Hello? Is this thing on? The chooser desk accessory. 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 This of course is giving you uh, examples of 22 kilohertz, 11 kilohertz, different ways to record the sound and compress the sound and you can hear how uh, different each of the samples are. And this is giving basically a demonstration of how Mac Recorder can be used for certain companies or for training purposes. To print to a laser printer, go to the Apple menu and select the Chooser Desk Accessory. Click on the laser printer resource. Click on the proper printer name. You should also enter your username. Click in the close box. And we'll look at Mac Recorder software on our own, so let's quit out of here. For my first recording test, I'll use SoundEdit version 2.02. .02. 
and record using the onboard mic of the Mac recorder, we first need to make sure that everything is set up right. And uh, to begin, I'll just do the highest quality recording, which is 22 kilohertz. Later on, I'll do each of these settings so that you'll be able to compare them. Uh, we only have one Mac recorder, so it's going to be mono. You can actually record in stereo if you have two Mac recorders. And I need to choose the printer port, otherwise it will not work. And it says I have enough RAM, 32 gigabytes of this SE30 will allow for 331.4 seconds of total recording time. Before I actually start recording, I'll just give you a quick overview of the controls in this bottom left corner of the window. Uh, the microphone icon is to start the recording. The speaker icon is to play back what you have recorded. We can't do anything now because as you can see, there's no waveform here. Nothing's been recorded yet. Uh, this little guy here compresses the horizontal width of the waveform. And this guy, if we click it, and right now I'm talking into the Mac recorder's microphone. If I move the gain up a bit, you can see how it's uh, changing. And, and this, this will allow me to uh, change the gain of the Mac recorder uh, to get it just right before I actually start my recording. And then uh, over here, we can see if we click this, and if I talk into the Mac recorder, uh, right now you can see that most of my voice uh, seems to be in the sub one kilohertz range right there, although there are some peaks at three kilohertz and all the way up to five. But I guess my S's, S's will go up a little bit, but, but again, most of your voice is going to be at the low end, and that's what is being shown here. I'll just give you a couple quick examples on what you can do with pre-recorded sounds. Uh, you need to start off by selecting your sound, at least the part that you want to manipulate. And uh, then you can do some fun things like going up to the settings and then set pitches. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. And then we can go up to effects and do fun things like echo. We use the default settings. Now we can play back the sound. This is a test yes, of the yes, Mac Recorder, Recorder sound, sound system. system. This is this only is a test. test. Preparing to save a file is easy. We just cut off the parts that we don't need. Then we go to the file menu and save as and there is no wave output, but AIFF is audio IFF. And we can call it whatever we want. And save it like that. It's that easy. Before we start recording, we need to determine how to record. And there's three ways that we can do that. First, we can take the Mac recorder and speak directly into the microphone. And I could just say test, test, or whatever I want, just like this. That is the lowest quality way. The second way is to connect an external microphone into the microphone input. And I actually had to buy a microphone. This is a Boya model microphone because all of my other mics, including the mic that I'm using right now, my uh, little lav mic down here, it doesn't have any kind of power source. So you need to have a powered mic, whether it be battery, battery power or something else, in order for it to work. And this very inexpensive, about a $20 Boya mic has a little switch on it. So you can switch it to camera, and that'll turn on its battery power. And then you just speak directly into the mic. I put a, text, uh, I put a link for you in the text description below. That is the second method. The third method is the highest quality method. And you just take a 3.5 millimeter plug, put it into the line level input, and then the other end of your plug, you would connect to your audio source. Now you can sometimes use a headphone jack if you adjust the volume just right, but it's really best to use a dedicated line level output. And I have a Sony uh, D100 audio recorder that I'm actually recording my voice with right now, and it has a dedicated line level output that works perfectly with the Mac recorder to get great sound. 
So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to make some various test recordings at 22 kilohertz, so the highest quality that Mac Recorder and SoundEdit can record at. And I would recommend putting on some headphones uh, so that you can more clearly hear the differences between the different sound files. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. To get the highest quality line input sound on Mac Recorder, I'm going to use my $800 Sony D100 audio recorder to pre-record my test sound on the recorder using my wired lav mic and the recorder set to linear PCM uncompressed at 48 kilohertz, 24 bit. Now that's quite a bit higher than even CD audio quality. And then I'm going to uh, take this 1 8 inch jack cable and I'm going to connect to the line output of the D100 recorder. And then the other end, I'm going to connect to the line input of Mac recorder. Now all I need to do is click the record button and then quickly press the play button on my recorder. This is a test of the Mac recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is a test of the Mac Recorder sound system. This is only a test. This is Fairlawn's HyperSound software. I am not going to go into detail on in this because sound edit is so much better. All this is really for is for recording and playback. You see we've got an output level for the Mac speaker. Uh, we've got a test here. And uh, before I can actually use it, I need to make sure you choose the right port. It's on the printer port, so I need to choose it here. Click Test, and I can just talk into the Mac recorder, and you can see that the input level goes up as I speak. And uh, then you can use all available memory, record for a fixed amount of time, choose your quality settings. And then down at the bottom, you can copy, paste, and so on into other HyperCard stacks. And that's pretty much what this is for. And now I want to show you just something very, very quickly here. I've rebooted into System 7.5 and I've loaded the extension such that inside the sound control panel in the sound input section, you can see Mac Recorder there. And if we click Options, we can see that the Mac Recorder is using the printer port. Pretty neat. But here's the neat part that I want to show you right now. You know that you have alert sounds. You can easily click the Add button now because you have Mac Recorder. So I'm going to click Add, and then it gives you this very nice dialog. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put my mouth right up against the Mac Recorder's built-in mic and uh, record the world's greatest beep sound. Beep. And now we can play it back. Beep. And there you have it. All we have to do is save, and we can type in a particular name, we'll call it JDW Beep, and click OK, and now it's going to save it, and so now we can just test it. Beep. And there you go. So of course you can uh, record your own fabulous beep sounds too. Very easy, very slick, and um, one of the, the great features of Mac Recorder, I would say. Add your own beep sounds. By the way, you can also do this uh, in System 6, add sounds of your own using SoundMaster, and I put a link for you in the text description below. So, what did you think of the sound files? Well, <laughs> I think the younger you are, the, pre the less likely you are to appreciate them. Uh, and that's because back in the day, Mac Recorder was all you had. For years, 
in the mid-1980s, you know, Apple didn't make a way for you to get audio into your Mac. And of course, Macs were, were 8 megahertz, 68,000 machines. They didn't have a lot of horsepower like our computers did today. So 22 kilohertz, 8-bit, that was really up there in terms of the quality. But uh, if you listen to the sound files, even the top end uh, line input files, which sound better than the bit built in mic, uh, still are not anything you can say, wow, this is, sounds pretty halfway decent compared to a modern file. It's just night and day different to uh, what kind of audio we have today. But um, I would say that the Mac recorder is a nifty little device and how practical it is for you really depends upon you. Uh, there could be some of you out there who have one, just, it's just sitting in a closet and you never use it. And in that case, I would say, why not use it? You know, it, 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 you can get some good use out of it. If you have a Mac Plus to the Beige G3, all of those computers have mini Den 8 serial ports. So you'll be able to put Mac Recorder to good use. And uh, at the highest quality settings, it doesn't sound too bad. And maybe you want some kind of vintage sound anyway. It's not quite as good as a, a high-end tape deck, but if you compare it with other tape decks and consider the hiss and all of that, you know, these 8-bit sound files are uh, fairly comparable and, and usable, especially for system sounds, right? You can have some fun with that. Um, but should you go out and buy one and pay hundreds of dollars for one? Well, then it becomes a more difficult recommend. Uh, if you're an avid collector and you don't yet have one for your collection, maybe paying four or $500 for a box set would be worth it. You know, my Mac recorder, I only have the Mac recorder. I didn't have the software, I didn't have the floppies, I don't have the manual. So I had to download the software from Macintosh Garden uh, and uh, the manual, well, there's, you know, the software kind of gives you some pretty good guidance on how to use it. But um, I, didn't, I don't have the complete set. And that didn't bother me, you know? So I, I, I wouldn't go out and pay $500 for one. And the reason why is because if you have a modern computer or modern audio equipment, it's best to just record your sound on that or maybe you have an audio file that's already pre-recorded that you wanna use on your old Mac. Well, uh, just save it down to 8-bit 22 kilohertz, even 11 kilohertz, and uh, just move the file from your modern Mac to your vintage Mac, and you're good to go. Now to do that, I'm not paid to recommend it, but I highly recommend this. This is the floppy EMU that you connect to the floppy connector. You can connect it externally or internally as well, and it's so nice. I use it all the time. This is more useful than the SCSI to SD solutions out there, even though they serve their purpose well. This guy is just what everybody should have. And Big Mess of Wire sells this for a very reasonable price, but you can take out the SD card, put the SD card uh, in your modern Mac, and load it up with all of your sound files that you want to have on your vintage Mac. And then you have your machine switched off, you plug in the floppy EMU, boot it up, and you can move it over to your hard disk. Now, if you're working with a lot of sound files, it's not really good to work with a floppy-based only system for that, unless it's just a few beep sounds. Um, you really wanna save them on a hard drive. But the floppy EMU makes it a practical thing to do. And that way, even if you don't have a Mac recorder, you can get sounds onto your vintage Mac. So overall, I think Mac recorder is an interesting device, and it certainly has an interesting history, especially about the uh, space shuttle and how it was used on that. So I hope uh, that you like this video and before I close I would like to thank two very special people for having been uh, generous in contributing to this channel. The first person I have thanked in the past but he deserves thanks again. Now I do privately thank each and every one of you who donate anything to this channel uh, but I wish to say public thanks too and the reason I'm saying a second public thanks to this next person is because um, his name is Mauro As Asia Caferi and I probably botched his last name because I'm not Italian but Mauro has supported this channel on a monthly basis since March of this year 2021 and he's currently the only person that has ever done that and it's just 
a really humbling experience for me. Uh, it's also encouraging for me to make more videos. And so in addition to thanking him, I'd also like to apologize as well because over the past couple of months, I've been really busy and I'm shipping my daughter off to college in the United States and a bunch of other things I've had to deal with at work that I haven't been able to invest as much time in my videos. So I apologize for that, but it's not a case where I've given up on making videos or anything like that. It's not because I'm lazy. In fact, one of the big reasons I haven't been investing as much time in my videos is just I've been investing time in a certain project. I cannot, I, it's a zip the lip time. I cannot tell you any details at all right now other than to say it's a forthcoming thing that pretty much any of you who have the desire can participate in and it's not going to cost you anything and I think you're going to like it. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Just like Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. But it is coming and that's why I've been a little bit, you know, delinquent in, in getting out uh, videos is because I've been working on that along with a team of other people. So that is coming. Thank you again, Maro, for your support of this channel. I really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank the second person who made an extremely generous uh, donation in the month of June this year. And his name is Kai Robinson. Uh, many of you may know that name, and those of you who don't, I just wanna say he is the magic man, not because he donated to this channel, but for the amazing things that he has done for our Mac community. Uh, he's an amazing content creator and engineer. And he came out with the SE Reloaded Macintosh SE Motherboard Reverse Engineering Project. That's right, he actually created the entire Macintosh SE Motherboard. It is a working board. It is being sold now at Mac Effects. So I put a link for you in the text description below. He didn't pay me, you know, his donation had nothing to do with me saying anything about that at all. This is just me telling you, for those of you who don't already know. And what was even more humbling for me is that not only did he make this really generous donation, and I wish to thank you so much for that. You know, I, I've already said my thanks to him privately, but my goodness, I just have to thank, thank Kai again publicly. My thanks alone isn't enough, really. Uh, you know, he didn't donate a million dollars or anything like that, but for me, there are certain amounts that are just, I consider to be big, and he made a, a donation like that, so I really appreciate it. And he didn't stop there, but he also shipped me something as well. And I, I hasn't, it has not arrived yet, so I cannot show you anything or tell you anything about it, other than to say it is one of his SE motherboards. And I'm, I'm going to do a video on that when it does finally arrive. But he not only shipped me the board, but he shipped me with a lot of things that I need to assemble the board to, which is just, he went out of his way to do this. And I wish to thank you, Kai, publicly before everyone today. Thank you very much for that. Definitely, this is gonna make for a great video. And uh, it's a through hole job. Through hole means the soldering job, you've got legs that go through the entire board as opposed to surface mount. And I love through hole. I love it through and through. <laughs> I'm not an SMD guy so much. I can do SMD soldering, sure, but I just don't love it like through hole because through hole parts usually are big enough to where if one of them jumps across the room, you can find it. Whereas surface mount, once it flicks across the room, it's gone, you know? Um, but that is going to be an upcoming project. And I just like to say, if you were in this man's shoes, and if you had reverse engineered an entire motherboard and that's all you ever did for the vintage Mac community, that alone would get your name etched in stone forever. And truly, the name Kai Robinson will be etched in stone forever because of that. But Kai didn't stop there. No, he went on to reverse engineer the Macintosh Classic motherboard as well. So he also has his Classic Reloaded project. Links to all of this is down in the text description below. You can see his uh, wiki, his GitHub, other places like the Mac Effects uh, uh, sale for the SE motherboard is also down there too. He even did Macintosh 2X RAM. So when you check out the links, you'll be able to see uh, all of his projects that he's, he's been working on and the projects that are still ongoing. 
the classic board assembly uh, is being done by Bruce Rain. He's already got three videos out on it now and I think he's pretty much uh, closing in on getting that finished. So uh, as of th this moment right now, that board isn't for sale publicly, but I expect that to happen pretty soon. So I just, you know, I'm not trying to announce it on behalf of Kai, but just saying these are the things that this man has created for our community. And above and beyond my th humble thanks to him for supporting this channel, I'd just like to say because of the amazing work he's done, we as a community really do need to rally together and support this man, uh, either through purchasing his, uh, his devices that he's come out with, or if you don't even need one, then uh, maybe just approach him and say, wow, you're amazing. <laughs> and I think that would really make his day just to see the outpouring of love and support from people such as yourself uh, who recognize some of the things that he's doing and that would encourage him to keep going <laughs> because there's so many other things that could be reverse engineered and that we could benefit from as well. So if you've watched this video from the beginning all the way to now, thank you. Thank you. If you really liked the video, and I hope you did, <laughs> please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not already subscribed, I'd love to have your subscription. And once you're subscribed, be sure to ring the bell or actually click the bell icon because it will ring automatically when I come out with a new video. I wish each and every one of you a great day. Take care, folks.